Well, everybody's so prompt at the Scott Club and they go quiet to order. Mm -hmm. wasn't quite the case with the dinner, but uh, at talks that tends to be the case. Anyway, welcome everybody to this year's Scott Club Colloquium, uh, an event which is customarily timed to be as close as possible to Scott's birth date on the 15th of August, and we're within three days uh, this time round. In the last two decades, uh, we've also been blessed by the opportunity to celebrate a number of key literary bicentenaries, such as The Lady of the Lake in 2010 and Waverley in uh, 2014. An effort has also been made, an effort has also been made in some instances to fit the location of the colloquium to the work in question, the Trossacks in the case of the Lady, uh, and in that of Waverley, Abbotsford, where Scott is famously supposed to have retrieved his unfinished first novel from a desk drawer in a lumber room before resuming it during the Christmas vacation of 1813 to 14. And the actual room we were given for our colloquium rather resembled that lumber room, I felt. Last time we first, last year we first intended to hold the colloquium on Rob Roy in Ross Priory at the foot of Loch Lomond. Uh, before the cost of booking and travel made this inadvisable, turning instead to the new club at lunchtime, a venue and timing which, from the turnout, appears to suit a number of our members. This year round, one might claim, if the expression has any remaining validity, to have a cake and eat it uh, situation, in that the location admirably, admirably fits the present work under consideration, the heart of Middle Earthian, that is, first published in the summer of 1818, and arguably Scott's one and only fully Edinburgh novel. Of course, it hasn't been possible to hold this colloquium exactly in the location that gives the novel its title. No, not the football club, uh, but the old Edinburgh toll booth, which was demolished in, 18, in 1817. But we are within a mile or so of some of the places where the main and events in the story occurred, the site of the gallows in the grass market, the Edinburgh Law Courts in Parliament Square, and the grasslands beneath Salisbury Crags. We have also a specially qualified speaker today in Professor David Purdy, already known to many of you, I'm sure, as a two-term chairman of this club, holding the office status for six years, during which he helped raise the profile of meetings and hosted some memorable dinners. David is a medical professor emeritus and a former clinical sub-dean of, uh, of the Leeds University Medical School. His specialism, I believe, being osteoporosis, uh, the brittle bone disease. Since retirement, he has given full event to another side of his intellectual interests, establishing himself as a leading light on the Edinburgh intellectual scene and an authority on Burns, Scott, and the Scottish Enlightenment, Enlightenment, among other things. As well as work in preparing the fourth edition of the Burns Encyclopedia, he is the author of a humorous book on golf, and honorary fellow of the Institute for Advanced Studies at the University of Edinburgh, something we share, by the way, David, um, where he has been working on a revision of David Hume's key philosophical works. More apposite still to our present situation, he has published redactions of two novels by Scott aimed at facilitating the modern reader, Ivanhoe in 2012 and The Heart of Midlothian in 2014, of which I note there have already been four reprintings. The main plan today is that Professor Purdy will talk for about 20 to 25 minutes, covering both the novel and his own work in adapting it, this being followed by a general discussion amongst those present, the formal meeting then ending with sandwiches at about one o'clock. I have with me copies of some of the main manifestations of the heart during its long publishing history, including parts of the four-volume first edition and magnum opus version, the EEWN volume, and David's own redaction, in case anyone would like to consult these afterwards. Also, a list of possible topics for discussion, if needed, though this may well be left behind by the time our speaker has finished. Professor Purdy.
Well, thank you, Peter. Great pleasure to be back at this uh, podium and uh, microphone. Am I at the right level from it, Lee? Yes, sir. Uh, and a pleasure to be speaking again to the Sir Walter Scott Club of Edinburgh on the subject dear to my heart. Um, and to show you, if, if I may, some images to illustrate um, a fairly recent uh, seminar at the university, at the uh, Institute for Advanced Study in Humanities, where I'm based, um, where I and others uh, discussed Scott in general and the problem of relating Sir Walter uh, to the present generation, especially to the younger generation of school and university students, there being a perception uh, within, within our younger generation, if I may put the millennials into, into a box there, that Scott is somehow long and difficult and hard to read. That may indeed be partially the case, and therefore what I'm about to describe to you is what came out of a press conference at the university in 2011, uh, when it was, we were discussing the problem of the perception of David Hume, Another of my main interests, there are great philosopher and perhaps the greatest star of that constellation of stars of the Scottish Enlightenment. Uh, why was Hume not in the shops, said a journalist from Glasgow. Well, in fact, he didn't say that. He said, how's Hume not in the shops? <laughs> and the chairman of the panel, a very distinguished philosopher who has sadly just recently died, uh, Nick Phillips, Nick said, um, well, the problem is that Hume writes beautifully, as does Walter Scott, he said, but two of Scotland's greatest authors are not was widely read as they should be, and for different reasons. Uh, we're concentrating at that point on Hume, and the problem, problem with Hume is although he writes beautifully in 18th century English, 18th century English has moved on, both in terms of syntax, grammar, uh, punctuation, and indeed the signification of many nouns, verbs, adjectives used by Hume 250 years ago. And in fact, in our work on Hume at the moment, just as a sideline, uh, we're up to 90 words, which, if read directly without uh, glossing, would completely mislead the reader. Anyway, the problem with Scott, however, we felt was probably longevity, or rather the length of the, uh, of the novels. And this came to a head at, uh, at Princeton University seminar, uh, the theological seminar, of which a distinguished former director I see before me in the audience at Princeton. Um, where uh, an American professor of literature said to me, what is your problem with Scott? What, what are you, why are you doing this to Ivanhoe and to uh, the heart of Midlothian? What, what is your problem with Scott? And I got quite irritated with this guy and said, well, my problem with Scott, frankly, is the hardback covers of his books. And the place went very quiet. And uh, my colleague said, the hardback covers? What's wrong with them? I said, they're too far apart. <laughs> And then, so now what we have done is to reduce Ivanhoe and now Heart of Midlothian to the length of a modern novel. And the, the work on it was uh, very interesting. I'll come to, to that to summarize it shortly. But I thought you might like to see some images culled from the, uh, the, the, our own holdings at the university and from the National Archives of Scotland to describe what went on here. And as Peter mentioned, it was in the summer of 1818. Uh, seven, well, about seven months after the publication of um, uh, Rob Roy, was it, the, the, the preceding novel, that Scott brought out um, Heart of Midlothian. He was very keen to finish it by the summer. He was infused with good health, because if I may put my medical hat back on, which I shouldn't do being now an emeritus, Scott had been suffering from cholecystitis, and that is a inflammation of the gallbladder brought on by an impaction of stones within the gallbladder itself. Dreadful condition before we had antibiotics and surgery, cholecystectomy, to remove the gallbladder, an operation I've had myself. But in those days, Scott was very, very unwell. He then must have had a disimpaction of the gallstone because his health recovered. And he got on with the writing of Heart of Midlothian through the spring of 1818, amazingly for him, working after dinner and not just in the mornings as many of us do. He would get up at dawn at Abbotsford and work from dawn up till about nine o'clock when uh, he would have to receive his guests and the eternal flow of, of, of visitors to Abbotsford would then have breakfast with him and with uh, Lady Charlotte Scott. This house, said Lady Charlotte, who spoke all her life with a French accent, this house is not an house, it is an hotel. <laughs> and this was part of the work in the morning. This is this great study, you've all seen it, with the desk uh, and the chair. And the Heart of Midlothian itself, I remember seeing this for the first time as a 10-year-old, 
uh, here with my, my parents and with family friends in Edinburgh, where my, my father said that the tradition, David, is to spit on this. And indeed, that was the old tradition in Edinburgh, is to spit on this very spot, which marked the site of the old toll booths, where public hangings were to, would take place in olden times. So my mother heard my father saying that under no circumstances, said my mother, who was a true old uh, 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 Edwardian, who are you going to spit on anywhere in the street? And so we did not, but that is it to this day. And the children in the audience would see it, you may have seen it yourselves, um, uh, young Simpsons here, uh, outside the Cathedral of St. Giles. And as a schoolboy here at, uh, at, at the uh, uh, High School of Edinburgh, Walter Scott would have learned of the story, perhaps, which would then evolve itself into the heart of Midlothian. He would know what the heart of Midlothian was. It was the site of the old Tobit. Interesting, on this first day of the third test between England and India, uh, that we can see 200 years ago, uh, this is 1805, um, uh, after Scott, of course, had left, long left the, the school here, the high school of Edinburgh, the kids are playing cricket in the yard. Interesting. I had no idea that cricket was of such antiquity in Scotland. As a schoolboy, learning about the stories of old Edinburgh, which is the great basis of the novel, meeting here with Burns for the first and the last time in the presence of Adam Smith and, and James Hutton and their host, uh, Professor uh, uh, Adam Ferguson on the left here, uh, the, the man whose great book on the nature of civil society is the foundation document of sociology. But this is a remarkable place and some of the images still survive of the old Tobos with which this great novel of Scots begins. And this is the platform here where felons were launched into eternity. If you were of major significance, you, you died in the grass market. If you were just a common felon, uh, you died here. And of course, St. Giles in the background, and this is the great building of the Tobus, the city jail, demolished as Peter mentioned in 1817. Here's another view of the, uh, of, the, of the launch pad, if I can put it that way. And you see the pole jutting out from the western end of the Tobus building itself. That is where the rope went over. And after, uh, the, after which, of course, the felon himself would uh, go over. Another interesting view down from the lawn market, looking down to the Tobus building. Uh, and St. Giles with its famous aircock behind. This is uh, an excellent view of the, from the early 19th century of what the High Street looked like at that remarkable time in our history, towards the very end of the Enlightenment uh, period itself. Interesting here, we were looking at this earlier with, with uh, uh, Ian Torrance and with Peter. This is the aerial view, if you like, from an old map of the site of the beginning of the novel. Here's the Tolbooth. Here is the Luckenbooths, which means the locked booths, in which silversmiths and goldsmiths would have their emporia, uh, and where the famous Luckenbooth brooch allegedly was first brought uh, to prominence by one of our silversmiths. And here is the Luckenbooth right building right in the middle of the high street, a very narrow passageway both on the, the northern and the southern side, with the cranes or trees here, the, the, the little shops abutting the wall of St. Giles here. The lawn market, of course, to the left and on down the high street towards the Canagate here. And here, do you see these stairs um, on, the, on the southern side of, the, of Parliament Square? These are the stairs down which uh, the, the, the escape was made uh, after the famous uh, uh, fight and, uh, and, and struggle in St. Giles Kirk. Uh, because before you were hanged in the grass market or uh, from the Tobus uh, uh, balcony, um, you were taken to the church to be uh, not absolved, because this is a Presbyterian church, of course, but to be reminded of your sins and uh, that uh, eternity awaited you uh, very shortly. And down in the borders, of course, uh, it may well be that in, uh, in Galloway, in DeFries and Galloway, Scott picked up the trail of Helen Walker. He read extensively, of course, in the history of the borders and the DeFries and Galloway all along southern Scotland. That was very much part of his, uh, of his reading matter and stories of uh, what uh, might have occurred. I can't resist showing this guy, by the way. This is Tom Purdy, and I'm still determined uh, to find out that he was one of my ancestors. Uh, sadly, not a sh nothing biological remains of Tom above ground. And short of uh, uh, 
uh, digging him up in the kirkyard of uh, Melrose Abbey and doing a DNA test. I'm not ever going to be sure whether I think he was one of my ancestors, just from his general behavior. Uh, <laughs> I remember that he met Scott in court. He was up on a charge of poaching, found guilty by the sheriff of Selkirkshire, Walter Scott himself, of course, fined, and Tom immediately demanded time to pay, my lord. And the sheriff said, how much time do you require? And Tom said, that depends, my lord. It depends on what, said the sheriff. It depends how the salmon are running, says Tom. <laughs> and later, of course, he was then taken on charge as the forester and the factotum and the estate officer and the librarian uh, at Abbotsford uh, and was totally devoted to Scott uh, to the end of his life. And interestingly, when, when Tom Purdy died in 1829, um, you know, there's a letter from by Sophia to her sister Anne, the two daughters of Sir Walter, uh, and Charlotte Scott and Sophia saying, I've never seen Papa like this. He cannot wait to get to Edinburgh. That's very interesting because usually Scott couldn't wait to get to Abbotsford. But because of Tom Purdy's death, he was he was devastated. Waverley began the pr process. Are you okay there, Lee? You're yeah. up and down like a, like a fiddler's elbow. Turning from one side to the other. Okay. Waverley, of course, began the process, as uh, Peter mentioned, in 1814. Uh, and then we have this four years later, the, uh, the Heart of Edwardian. Uh, is published here in Edinburgh. The, I thought I'd put it, I knew you'd have this image of Scott. This is the best image medically of Scott that I've ever seen because it illustrates the fact that, that his, oops, that his, his right, his right leg here, oh, no, 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 back. His right leg, can you see, is quite obviously withered. Scott was very lucky as a child because generalized poliomyelitis, which, uh, which affects him on one limb only, is fatal if it's general. Generalized polio is always fatal. But Scott was very lucky to, for that three of his four limbs escaped the, uh, the loss of the driving neurons, um, the, the, the nerves which drive the muscles of the right leg. And that meant, very importantly, that he could not join the army. And again, with a distinguished soldier I see in the back of the room, there is no doubt in my mind that if Scott had had the use of all four limbs, he would have been a highly successful officer um, of our armed forces. But this prevented it. He could ride a horse, of course, and he was, in the, he was a quartermaster of a cavalry volunteer unit during the Napoleonic Wars, but, um, but he was to be a writer and, of course, a lawyer. Down in the borders, he may well have got, got wind of the story of, of Helen Walker. This is the Kirk of Iron Grey not far from Robert Burns's farm of Ellisland in the Nith Valley in Dumfriesshire. And this is the, the lass who walked all the way to, to London uh, to obtain a pardon for her sister, who was under sentence of death for infanticide. And as we've, you see in the novel, and as, as we may discuss later, in Scotland at that time, um, if, you could, if you were known to have been pregnant, but you had not exchanged any uh, news of the pregnancy with your family or anyone else, and you could not produce the child, it was assumed that you had killed the child. There was a presumption of infanticide, which is the central part of the prosecution of Effie Deans, um, as we shall see. And here's the back stairs of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, from the kirk, down which uh, George Staunton, uh, uh, although under an alias, escaped at the beginning of the novel. And of course, Scott, as the supreme historical novelist, took a real event, the great riot in 1736 in Edinburgh, when Captain John Porteous, captain of the city guard of this town, was lynched in the grass market. He having ordered his men to open fire uh, on a mob, well, or upon the citizens rather, um, who were being uh, tumultuous uh, during a previous uh, execution. And uh, Porteous allegedly, I understand from our historians, actually told his men to fire over the heads of the crowd, forgetting of course that the windows lining the, uh, the, the grass market were lined with people. There were people sitting, standing, watching from the windows. And the volley of shots went over the head of the crowd but hit the windows. Six people were killed, 30 were seriously injured. And the result, of course, was this major riot in which John Porteous was pulled out of the tollbooth through the gate of the tollbooth, which was burned to the ground to get access to the jail, taken to the grass market and lynched from a dyer's pole. This is very interesting. This is one of the very first photographs ever taken. And having mentioned the Tobuth, here is the Tobuth door. And Scott, through a friend of his, you can, you can see very faintly here, this indentation in the wall of Abbotsford. Here's the main door of Abbotsford. But here is the ancient door of the Tobuth. And a friend of Scott 
the Dean of Guild of the time allowed the door to be sent down to Melrose and then incorporated uh, into the fabric of Abbotsford I itself. And here's a, uh, a more uh, close-up, tightened-up shot of the door itself to this day, which can be seen in the wall of Abbotsford House itself. Images follow the, the great uh, second volume of the um, third volume of the uh, of the book, the great journey of uh, Jeannie Deans, the heroine of the, one of uh, Scott's great heroines, alongside uh, Rebecca uh, in Ivanhoe, and other. Scott isn't, was not always terrific at the delineation of female character, but he really hit the mark right here with with uh, uh, Madge Wildfire and her her mother Meg Murdoch, and here here appearing. Uh, Madge in front of the uh, uh, of the councillor. Um, what's his name again, Peter? And there's two of them: Sharpit, Lower, and Middles. Middles, yes, Middleborough. That's right. Yes, he, she's appearing before Middleborough to be examined uh, in Edinburgh. And much of the action taking place, of course, in the early parts of the book, uh, in the shadow of Salisbury Crags here, <laughs> with the, the, the chapel up on the hill here, uh, not far from uh, the, from the palace of Holyrood itself, and. Her father, Davy Deans, this classical Presbyterian covenanting Cameronian minister, mortal foe of Roman Catholicism, he desperate for the removal of Erastianism, that is, church and state uh, arrangements, who found a place on the, uh, on the Scott Monument just a few yards from where we sit at the moment. But of course, the basic problem of the, for Georgina Deans was the uh, guilty verdict when her sister Effie here, made pregnant by George Staunton, uh, but the child had been taken from her uh, in postnatally, just after the child was born. It was abducted uh, by, by Wadge Wildfire and sold by her mother, Meg, to an itinerant woman. The child is not to be found, cannot be produced in court, and is therefore one of the uh, major problems for Effie in the court here, in the court of session, found guilty of infanticide, sentenced to death. A wonderful portrait of her. Uh, this is by James O'Neill Whistler, the great American portraitist. A study in, uh, in, in yellow and blue here is the title of this beautiful work by, uh, by Whistler. And here's a view of the, of, the, of the chapel on the hill, uh, looking back down towards the palace and the, and the city of Edinburgh, where the famous meeting takes place between Jeannie Deans and Staunton. Uh, another view of the, uh, of the toll booth and, and the old town. The famous meeting of the sisters in the toll booth, where, Meg, where, where Jeannie uh, uh, tells her sister that she cannot tell a lie. The basic problem in law here is that Jeannie Deans could tell a white lie in court and say that she knew about her sister's pregnancy, about Effie's pregnancy, but that would be improper for her in terms of her religious beliefs. She would rather not tell the lie, thereby effectively sensing, sentencing her, husband, her sister to, uh, to the gallows, but she would go to London to seek uh, a... Uh, a pardon from the king. Only the king could reverse the decision of the court in terms of a capital charge. And uh, here she is setting off and followed by the Laird of Dumby Dykes, who is a, a great admirer of Jeannie on her way south. She meets up with Madge, of course, one of the great characters of the novel, and her mother. And on the way south, Scott describes in a marvelous series of, of chapters the journey of, of Jeannie Deans to London, uh, with the famous song of the Robin and the Rest and Proud Maisie, which we'll skip past at the moment. This is Proud Maisie, a, a, an image by, the, uh, by an artist of the 19th century. The poem, of course, has a feature uh, in the novel itself. And then they come up to Macallan Moore here. This is the ancestor of the present Duke of Argyll, uh, Torco Campbell. Uh, my mother, being a Campbell, um, we regard uh, this man and his successor um, as the clan chief of that side of the family. And uh, when we meet him, we just met him a couple of times, he's always addressed not as uh, Your Grace, as a, a duke would normally be formally addressed, but as Bacallan Moore, which is in the Gaelic means the son of the great Colin, son of the great Colin Campbell of Loch the founder of the, the dynasty. And the, the, the meeting, the famous meeting with, uh, with the Queen, Queen Caroline of of uh, Brandenburg Ansbach, the wife of King George II, who was very frequently absent in Germany looking after his estates and his regality uh, in Hanover. And this lady was a remarkable uh, politician and diplomatist, and it was she 
who met with Jeannie Deans, of course, under the aegis of the Duke of Argyll here, and the famous conversation took place at which the Queen agreed to intercede with King George uh, for the commutation, or rather the pardoning, or the reversal of the sentence of death. And, you know, several images in the, in the archive of this famous meeting where Jeannie makes her famous speech, which I'll read to you later. It takes just a couple of minutes to do so. Finally, yes, uh, that's, this is a letter to David Deans's cottage. Um, this was, uh, as it was, a hundred years ago. Sadly, no longer. But uh, a living link with uh, the great novel uh, has been lost. I thought I'd show you one holiday snap. Sixty years ago, my parents and I went off to see our cousins in Kintyre, where we still have a cottage at Nakrahanish, and we went on this. Because 60 years ago, the Clyde Steamers were all named after characters in Walter Scott's novels. This is the Genie Deans. One was called the Talisman, one was called Ivanhoe, one was called... Uh, 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 the Waverley, the Waver of course, the one that still survives, was named after his first novel, uh, of course, uh, Waverley. And so, um, let me just summarize uh, what I've been saying and what, how the novel came to, came to be written. It followed on uh, from Ivanhoe, and the idea was, w might it be possible uh, to contract the original uh, text, is about 189,000 words of uh, the uh, Heart of Midlothian, to 90,000, the length of a modern novel, with certain adjustments made to the length of sentences and certainly to the punctuation. I removed, I think, 1,700 commas uh, from Heart of Midlothian, and probably more colons than any of my colleagues in abdominal surgery, uh, as we then adjusted but the, 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 the text to, to read from page one to the last page. The action begins on page one in, in the redactions of Ivanhoe and of Heart of Midlothian. It does not begin on page one. Um, elsewhere. And the central reason for that is, it's not a criticism of Scott. The, we are dealing in Scott with the origins of the, uh, uh, of the historical novel. We're dealing with the very first ones. And an analogy came up at Princeton uh, two or three months ago when I was visiting a uh, lecturer there. And I was saying, well, the problem with Scott, of course, is that these models are Model T-Fords. The Model T-Ford was pretty well the first mass production car. Nowadays, they drive a Ford Mustang. You get into a Ford Mustang, you press the self-starter, you floor the accelerator, and off you go. With a Model T Ford, you have to crank it up. You have to get it started. It does not accelerate. It slowly gathers speed. And it's exactly the same with, with Scott's novels. And he wanders off the plot with wonderful descriptions of, uh, of landscape and personality. Um, uh, and uh, that is what I had to remove in order to bring the, the, uh, the, the length of the novel down to a manageable level, still keeping this tremendous storyline of Ivanhoe and Heart of Midlothian intact. In fact, I was re repeatedly reminded, working in my own study uh, here in, in India Place, in my house in Edinburgh, repeatedly reminded of being in my own operating theatre. I belong to a surgical speciality in medicine. And what I was doing, I found with, with Scott, was exactly the same as I did in my theatre. The removing the, anything which required a removal of a cyst or a, or a tumor or, or whatever while keeping the patient alive, not allowing hemorrhage to take place, not allowing the patient to, to go downhill while the surgery was going on, but still keeping the, keeping the patient going and like, hopefully with a longevity uh, yet to come. So that was the, that's the general uh, principle behind it. Could Scott be reintroduced was the question. Could it be reintroduced to a younger audience uh, by means of an adaption or a redaction um, to an original novel, thereby sending, uh, hopefully, the readers back to the original text? And I want to pay tribute to, to Peter and to his colleagues in the Edinburgh edition of the Waverley Novels. It is a work of consummate scholarship. It is the ultimate, I think, that will ever be produced in the way of what Scott actually wrote. Marvelous glossary. Uh, and uh, just to finish with the footnotes, they were of great help to me um, when I was preparing uh, these two books. But you'll notice if you have a copy of the, uh, 
uh, of the redacted version, which is sold very well, by the way, and uh, through many impressions, especially at Abbotsford, um, that you'll notice that the footnotes are very extensive compared to the original. The footnotes are superb in your edition, uh, but they're very extensive in mine because Scott assumes a knowledge of classical authors, ancient history, uh, legal terminology, theological uh, uh, small print, which are just not present in the modern audience. And many of the comments I've had from school teachers and from members of the public who've read the, the redaction uh, focus on the footnotes, on how it's essential to have uh, chatty and sometimes humorous footnotes explaining uh, what is in the novel itself. So there we are, Peter, in, uh, in re reasonable summary, I hope, is what has, we have been about. I'm very happy to, to open it up with you to discussion with our members. Thank you. Thanks, David, for that very colourful and interesting uh, account. Uh, of some of the images were, the, were new to me. I, I've been to Abbotsford so many times and never realised that the Todd Booth uh, door was stuck up there on the on the first story. Uh, whether it's the actual Todd Booth door, which was burnt down to release uh, George Staunton, uh, um, who, who is released. Um, from the prison, George Thornton. I, I don't um, no, well, no, to, to get hold of, um, um, of Porteous so that they can lynch him. Uh, I don't know. The, 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 if you read on the novel, they talk about them being replaced, the, the doors of the toll booth having been repaired. What exactly Scott ended up with, with those nails in the door, I don't know. Um, but I think um, as far as proceeding now, um, I did say that I brought. Uh, copies on. Uh, if you just bring them to me, this is, the novel originally came out in, in four volumes. Scott had contracted for four volumes. Some people think that he, he, he sort of went over, the, uh, over the, the mark, really. The fourth volume is a failure. In fact, you remove, uh, talking about sur surgical removal, you remove a large portion of the fourth <laughs> volume. Uh, nearly, well, the last ten chapters, I believe, yes. Um, but this is what it would originally have come out. Originally it had been in boards, but this has been turned into half boards bound, bound up uh, by the library that held it or the owner. But there were four volumes originally when it first came out. Then there's the, the Magnum, thank you, which looks like this in cloth boards. Uh, this was an unwieldy novel for the Magnum. Usually they'd get a three volume novel into two volumes of the Magnum. Uh, in the case of uh, The Heart of Middle Earth, it stretches rather bitterly in a bitterly sort of way over three volumes. Uh, this is the Edinburgh edition of the Worthy Novels. Um, I, I, it was Alison Lumsden and David Hewitt who did this immense uh, task. Some of us were behind the scenes as well. And, and it's huge. Uh, of course, it has all sorts of apparatus and glossary notes and uh, so on, but the actual novel itself in the middle is pretty huge. I, I feel that people at the time must have read uh, differently. They must have read in small, in sections, reading aloud often in a group of people. You're talking about punctuation. David, you've made the punctuation grammatical. Uh, the punctuation uh, in when these novels first came out was really indicative of when the reader paused it's a different sort of uh, punctuation, but there's a hell, hell of a lot of commas. And when we did the Edinburgh edition, we decided to leave mostly the first edition punctuation in place unless it distorted meaning or, or uh, uh, obscured rhetoric. Uh, we tend to leave it in place. But I think it was a different sort of reading that took place in the Victorian, uh, in the original Regency period compared with the way that people read, if they still read at all. Uh, now, uh, and then finally, David's redaction. Uh, this is a plug. Oh, he's got his own copy, yeah. and this is mine with a few notes in it, and it looks like that. My guess was, I think the, the number of words on a page is very much the same as the Edinburgh edition, though you've got more white spaces, you cut out paragraphs and reduce dialogue, and so on, which makes white space. But my guess, I think you actually mentioned figures, my guess it was less than half of the original parts yeah. of Middle Earthian. Uh, the point is, though, that there, there isn't such a thing as an ideal heart of Middle-earth, and it's been, it's been through various manifestations, uh, you know, all the way through its publishing history, and David's um, admirable redaction is just one instance of the way that the novel's been presented to the public over its uh, history of 200 years. 
Insofar as proceeding now, I'll leave those on the table again, if people want to have a look uh, when we're having uh, lunch afterwards. Uh, I think the way of proceeding, uh, I think if we could start off with people asking correct, uh, d questions to David directly about what he has been saying. <coughs> I've got one or two like that. And then perhaps we could open up into a general discussion. And I worked out four bullet points possible, possibly for discussion. Uh, truth telling. Is Jeannie right or wrong uh, not to tell that white lie which would free her sister? A lot of people have had, found difficulty in that in the past. George Bernard Shaw uh, said if you turn it into play, everybody would be shouting for Jeannie to tell the white lie to let her sister off the hook. Uh, that's one thing. The other is national issues. Is this a quasi-Scottish nationalist text? Uh, the English are, are misreading and mistreating the Scots, it seems, in several ways. Though the Scots are a rebellious lot, uh, lynching their own captain of the guard. Is that a an expression of nationalist feeling or just a mob going awry? I think if anything, David, if, you, if, I, if I may say so, so, the way you've presented the novel has increased the, the quasi-nationalist element rather than reduced it. Uh, you do in include from a magnum note that wonderful story about the, 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 the town clerk uh, or the, the city magistrate, whatever they were, being hauled up before the House of Lords and asked if they had any guns and saying we've only got a few such as we shoot dukes and fools with. <laughs> uh, by which they meant ducks and fowls, you see. That's a magnum note and you actually reintroduce it into the novel. You couldn't resist it, could you? You were own up, yeah. Um, the third bullet point is the final volume. Is, David, is it a failure? And uh, that presupposes people have actually read it. But was David right to omit it? Uh, and then possibly discussion of the pros and cons of redactions. Okay, so firstly, uh, questions, so I'm being a bit bossy, but there we go. Um, and actually possibly if people stand up, there are people who might know, know each other. If people, when they ask a question, can just introduce themselves to everybody, that would be helpful. But firstly, direct questions about what David has been saying. If I could just comment on that fourth um, section of the of, of the novel, um, I, I did I did actually edit it, uh, edited the whole thing, um, but I found in discussions with my publisher Gavin McDougall of Lewis Press um, here in Edinburgh, an excellent uh, publisher, uh, that when we finished uh, the third third volume uh, with Jeannie uh, returning to Scotland uh, with the uh, mutation of our sister's um, uh, sentence and, and meeting up with Reuben Butler, who we haven't mentioned yet, who had become her husband. Uh, Reuben Butler was a minister of the Kirk. Uh, it would seem to be a very sensible way to end. Uh, what we, uh, she meets up with Reuben Butler and closure. If we then were to carry on, it would add another uh, 60 or 70,000 words to the, uh, uh, to, to, to the novel. And the reception of Heart of Midlothian in the country was, is very interesting. Hugely popular with the general public, but there was a very muted response from the critics. And it was immediately pointed out that the, uh, the latter section of the, uh, of the book, where Jeannie, having returned and, and married Reuben Butler, then lives in an estate of the Duke of Argyll um, on the west of Scotland. Uh, and it's quite, to, to my mind, it clearly doesn't fit with the rest of the story. The natural ending of the book, I think, uh, was the, uh, the end of the third volume of Jeannie's Return. And it was alleged that Scott had been paid for the, for the, the remainder of the book, and therefore had to fill it in with, uh, uh, with, with his writing. Uh, but um, no, I don't regret knocking off that last bit of the, of the book, because the book runs at about 90,000 words, as I say, the, 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 the length of a modern novel, and it has, a, I think, quite a tidy ending. He, um, he was contracted for four volumes. He was. But he was originally thinking of having two tales within. There was going to be a second tale on the regalia, you see. Ah. But obviously the heart took off, and then he had to fulfill the four volumes. Um, but uh, I, in, even more radically, I think you could finish the novel with Scott's own third volume, with Jean having been successful. Yes. You know? But the last part of the volume is very melodramatic. It presents an ideal Scotland 
uniting the various components got on this imaginary island. Uh, it has George Staunton being killed by his own illegitimate son. It's highly melodramatic. And I think Scott is also working off some of his own feelings about his own brother, Daniel, who was never mentioned. But Daniel was a family disgrace and got a, a girl pregnant. She was a housekeeper uh, at Duddingston. Was she? Uh, yes. Uh -huh. got, got her pregnant and Scott arranged for him to be packed off to the West Indies and he came back in disgrace uh, and died. Uh, and I think Scott was working out a lot of, a lot of his own feelings about that. That's that very point. interesting. I had yes. never thought of that myself yes. because Daniel uh, came back not just disgraced because of his behaviour towards this girl, but because of his behaviour during an armed uprising in the West Indies. Yeah. Where he had run away. Yes. He had run away from the... Uh, the insurgents who were simply armed with machetes. <laughs> no, should I have done anything different? <laughs> but but uh, Elliot, he was a disgrace to the fact. Scott never spoke to him again. So I'm being Sorry, a, a bit bossy, and I saw a hand go up. David. Yeah. Yeah. Where did oh. you leave Effie? Where did I leave her? Yes. If you cut out the last um, volume, what was she by the time you finished? She, your she had married Staunton. We, we think we, we knew by the end of the of the redaction that she had married Staunton and was elsewhere, but not in this country. And of course, she she turns up with him in the in the the final volume, uh, which complicates matters uh, considerably. But no, she is she is away. She's safely uh, married to her lover. Uh, I wonder sometimes if what's wrong with the modern reading of Scott is that it takes five chapters to get into it, and it's the heart of Midlothian might not be the title that modern youth would be interested in. What about Jeannie Deans? Yes. Yes, I'm indeed. slightly biased because I did work on the Jeannie Deans at about the time you were sailing on it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Scott's titles sometimes don't quite match the, 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 the heroes of the, uh, of, of the work. Um, Ivanhoe doesn't have much to do with Ivanhoe. <laughs> the, the real hero of Ivanhoe, in my view, is Rebecca. Rebecca of York. But I don't think that would have been perhaps an acceptable title in the early 19th century. <clears throat> But she is, she is, she's the heroine. No doubt about that. Let me just, can I just, sorry, yes, ma'am, go ahead. I wonder how you keep the stories of Scott in a shortened version. Because they're quite important. I, I just, I'm I can't imagine it. Right. How you keep the spirit of Scott's writing. I'm sorry, I just can't hear. Can, to what extent can you keep the original spirit of Scott's writing? That's yes. Yeah. In well, the cut down version. Yeah, well, I, th I think I think I think we have uh, the, the <coughs> central central driving uh, motif of the of the reduction is to keep this tremendous driving storyline and the, the plot integrity intact, and that was nothing was done to remove that Scott's tr tremendous asset, which is his storytelling ability. It's a wonderful story, as is Ivanhoe. It's a ripping yarn. And uh, I hope it is fine, if you read the redaction, I hope you will finish it, having seen that the storyline does not falter, uh, as Scott intended from start to finish. Yes, I agree, it brings out the storyline very clearly. I think possibly one of the things which is necessarily omitted is the, or reduced, is the, the, the playfulness of Scott as a, a mysterious narrator who has all this kind of knowledge, you know. Yeah. None of the original readers in the Regency period could have known all those things, could have read Scott's words, known yes. about the technicalities of Scott's law yeah. and all the other specialisms that come in. And I think that was part of the original frisson in, in reading it, that you didn't, who is this author and I only get bits of this and I don't understand bits and so on. <laughs> You've made it clear, you see. Well, you clarified it. Well, um, okay. Yes. He, he also writes in the first person. You know, you'll notice in the first couple of, of, of pages, of the heart of Midlothian, when he's describing the erection of the gibbet in the grass market. And he's, he mentions, he writes in the first person, I saw this as a schoolboy, he said. Yeah. I saw it, because it erected overnight, it was never put up during the day. The gibbet, a hanging tree, went and the scaffolding around it, went up at night when no one was about, and it appeared the next morning with a terrible sensation of doom approaching for somebody. 
and he, he was a wonderful evocation of what capital punishment was like day to day in the Edinburgh of that era. He's quite amusing, if that's the correct word, about children going to hangings. In fact, Saddletree, a character you haven't mentioned, yeah. who's a very pompous person and thinks he knows all about the Scottish law and he doesn't. Uh, he, it, it, it says that his children can leave school for half a day to go and watch a hanging, which will be good for them. <laughs> and children do. I once in Cardiff Castle saw a recreation of a Civil War battle in which a, a bedraggled block of, lot of roundheads defeated a huge array of cavaliers, because everybody wants to be a cavalier. But in the interval, they, they recreated some of the punishments of the Commonwealth period, including a hanging. And they did a mock hanging, and all these children rushed up and looking under things like that. Scott knows about those sort of things, yeah. and it's very humorous. Yeah. If, again, if that's the right word, yes. I mean, to, to go back to the footnotes, I, mean, I, sp I spent such a long time with the footnotes, mm -hmm. because it, I, I'm talking sometimes to uh, it's my daughter here, my daughter, my son, who's a soldier, in fact. When they were around, when this was, I would say to them, come do, do you know about this? And all of them were educated in Edinburgh, in good schools, well educated. Uh, my daughter Mary, who's arriving or has arrived, is a graduate. But the, quite clearly, the modern educational system does not encompass anything like what we have in here. Mm -hmm. Mind you, Scott was Scott had a photographic memory or something very close to it, mm -hmm. and his knowledge, his polymathic knowledge across uh, law, civil, and uh, uh, and statute, common and statute law, civil law, criminal law, history of Scotland, history of Europe, um, uh, philosophy, and the Enlightenment period. I mean, it's, it is really quite. I am in awe of this guy. I thought I knew a lot about the Enlightenment until, the, but not nearly as much as, as he did. Here, example, in page whatever, um, Alexander Leslie commanding the, commanding the Covenanting army has to be in, in, introduced. To, I, I, what was that? I, I saw, uh, yeah, Dunn's law. Uh, the old Scots language as well has to be interpreted now to um, to our younger generation. I mean, I have got quite a bit of old Scots from my farming cousins in Ayrshire, who still talk to each other in the Lallans, the dialect of Burns, uh, and they talk to me in English. And then the phone will ring, and they're talking <laughs> Lallans to the cowman or to the to, to the to the grieve or the shepherd uh, uh, on the farm. And but he is this. Scott has clearly bilingual in Old Scots and, and English, uh, and that sometimes he forgets to tell an, an English audience. And this this book sold so well south of the border. I don't know what her, her English cousins would have made of many of the uh, terminologies here, which are not annotated and are not footnoted in the original. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> David, um, you mentioned that you were David, thank you very much indeed. Um, I, I'm actually not going to be able to stay much longer, and Peter had said something about truth-telling, so can I just say something very brief about that? Um, this, this dramatization of telling the strict truth, which Scott does so well, I mean incredibly well in this novel, um, that of course is not unique. And um, a very strict way of Telling the truth was endemic. Um, I'm fairly sure that Wesley said, I would not tell a lie were it to be the case that that would save the souls of the entire world. Now, um, it couldn't actually be more, more extreme than that. Um, clearly, truth telling of that kind is embedded in a certain way of reading scripture. And that's what you find in the Cameronian inheritance, which is described. And truth-telling was not the only virtue, but also keeping up the southern and, and various aspects of family life. So although it's, in a sense, bizarre to us, I think, there was a culture which lay behind it. It's very interesting. We, we live supposedly in a post-truth society now, so it's become an issue in the light of that, doesn't it? And um, I think truth-telling is important because if people tell even a white lie, it introduces them lying as a normality. And then all sorts of structures, including the law and religious belief, just start to crumble, don't they? So it is an important uh, it is indeed principle. A, there's another aspect to that, of course, here, in that this lie would have to be told 
uh, under oath yes. in court, which means perjury, which has always carried a major uh, penalty in mm. Scots law. Yeah. There are other say, bits in the novel where Jeannie Dean is, to use an expression which has also been used recently, uh, fairly recently, economical with the truth. Uh, she's, she's not, uh, you know, she will do that for when there are practical reasons, yeah, yeah. including to some extent her own advancement, I think, <laughs> you know. Um, not lying, but n not telling the truth. Or, you know. Peter, I, I better uh, tell you and, yeah. and, and the audience that I know a bit about this because um, my last university in England, the, the Chancellor was Lord, um, uh, Lord Armstrong of Ilminster who is the author of that very phrase, which he used in court in Australia, mm. if you remember, during the spy capture trial, when he was up against that formidable QC, who is now the Prime Minister of Australia. Um, and um, uh, he was asked, had you been economical? I, had, I was economical with the truth, he said. And when he was at dinner one evening at the university with my fellow, fellow uh, uh, academics, we said to him, Lord Armstrong, uh, did you mean that you had in any way um, removed the truth from a statement? No, 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 he said, no, no, no. I, everything I said in court was truthful. I didn't tell the whole story of the truth. Econ economy here was not in terms of ver in loss of veracity, but with, with, sheer, uh, with sheer loss of length. So he was truthful in what he said, but he didn't tell the whole, whole, whole story. Incidentally, Lord Armstrong of, of uh, Ilminster, the aforesaid, is the model for the old, the old um, Mandarin in Yes Minister. Do you remember how Sir Humphrey Appleby from time to time would meet um, with the, um, his old boss mm -hmm. uh, in, 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 in a club somewhere to discuss how they were going to deal with Jim Hacker, who was a minister? That's right. And they would have wonderful discussions such as the old boy Ilminster um, in, in, the, uh, in the series saying, um, Humphrey, this is, this is very serious. The minister has to be stopped. This, this policy of his could affect, it could affect the universities, uh, both of them. <laughs> <laughs> I think all of us are economical with the truth in our day-to-day -day lives. Did we are? On a very small scale, hopefully, you know, yes. Anything about the, the nationalist, um, and feelings, um, the way that in the, the relationship between England and Scotland as it uh, unfolds in the story and what it might mean. But a small bit of, pre of prologue to that then. What happened in, in Edinburgh was that the uh, John Porteous was sentenced to death by the court of session and, and that then there was a stay of execution. It, it wasn't a, an annulment of the mm -hmm. ruling. It was, a, it was a stay of execution ordered by the Prime Minister Walpole, the English Prime Minister, we're at this, remember, this is 1736, uh, 30 years after the, the union of the parliaments, after the creation of, the, of Great Britain and, uh, uh, and Ireland, as it was then. And um, the stay of execution incensed the population, and that led to the riot, which led to the uh, burning of the door of the Tobas, extraction of John Porteous, and his death in the long march. The, um, there's a, missus, a, a statement which Alex Salmon used to quote a lot by a character called Mrs. Howden in the story. She's one of the Edinburgh gossips in the story. She's described as a saleswoman, what exactly that means. Uh, and uh, uh, she says that it would be much better when we had the Parliament here in Scotland because we could reach out them, whereas you can't throw stones as far as London, she says, you know. And he used to quote that as a, as a, a support for the idea of Scottish independence. In fact, it, it's distorting the novel because it, it, it isn't a sort of truth pervaded by the novel. It's something which a character uh, yes. says, rather, a, a character who's got a very prejudicial view of things, possibly. Yes. Um, but these elements do come in. And the business of Jean going there and seeking an accommodation um, and the, the, the representation of the, 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 the Duke of Argyll, which borders on hagiography, uh, as someone standing up for Scotland, uh, are very strong elements in this novel. And I think that, that we mentioned that Scott possibly writing a story about the regalia, which he gave up. The regalia had been discovered earlier that year, the Scotch regalia, and Scott was already planning the King's visit of 1822, which meant bringing the King up to Scotland, the reverse journey to Jeannie going down. Uh, to London. 
So I think Scott is, 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 is aware of antipathies, particularly amongst the common people, the English people who uh, in Carlisle have gone on about Scottish witches and so on, you know. Yeah. Uh, he is looking for accommodation and an understanding between England and Scotland. And the novel also, I think, uh, highlights the two institutions left of Scotland. They're writ large in this novel, the, the Presbyterian form of church, a government, religious government, and the, the law, Scottish yes, law. Right. They're both major components in this novel. And both enshrined, of course, in the Act of Union, but, uh, which, allowed, which uh, mandated that we kept our law, our educational system, and our, our religion, uh, despite the union of the, of, of, of the parliaments. In 1707, yes. Well, those issues are there, and uh, yeah. Scott was very keen that we kept those aspects of our lives uh, beyond the three great parts of the tripod I've just mentioned: the law, education, and uh, and religion. And that was, for example, our banknotes. For example, he would then go, he would go to bat shortly after this. Uh, against the idea that the Bank of England only should issue uh, currency notes in this country. Uh, and he fought, the letters of Malachy Malagrowther, who was Scott, um, uh, resonated and detonated across the country, saying, under no circumstances are we going to give up our Bank of Scotland, Royal Bank of Scotland, and, and uh, then Linen Bank, later Clydesdale, uh, notes, and we have them to this day. Yes, I mean, a long-standing member, Paul Henderson Scott, uh, um, did an edition of that and also wrote a book about Scotland, Scotland, in which he claims the uh, letters of Malachi, Malachi are, are an independence uh, yes. um, manifesto. Yes. I wouldn't go so far as that, but those issues are there, there's no doubt about he, it. There's Scotland. no doubt he was a Scottish nationalist. There's no doubt in my mind equally that he'd have voted no in the referendum in, 19, in 2014, yeah. but he, he believed in the future of Scotland as part of a greater United Kingdom and Empire, remember, which was now fully established. Yeah. But he was very, very strong that we had to retain our national identity. Mm. And there's a famous story of Scott right out there on the mount, stopping on the railings of the mount, walking back from his daily dark, his daily duty at the court of session, and weeping over some issue which had had, had removed some of our national identity. I forget exactly what it was, but he was said, what's the matter, Walter? said his colleague with him. He said, and he said, it's every day it's happening. That aspects of our national uniqueness are dissolving into those of our mighty neighbor to the south. I was asked why I voted no in the referendum by Alex Salmon. <laughs> I said, Alex, Alex, I'm voting no because I'm a Scottish nationalist. Yeah. I believe in this country. Well, we might have another chance, who knows. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to stir the crowd up, but it's not working in the slightest. There's, there's Deirdre. Deirdre. Sorry, if you speak up yeah. here. I find the character of Jeannie Dean's tedious and the uh, extreme. I think Effie is actually the heroine of this novel. Yes. Whenever she appears, there's much more energy. I think that's partly the reason for the fourth volume, is that she captures Scott's imagination, and he had to go back to her, and that's yeah. why you get all this stuff that's higher than her uh, husband. But I think there's much more, um, I suppose, attention paid to Effie. And I think the difficulty is with the kind of the, the, the possibly murdered child is that on one hand the reader is enthralled and horrified at the same time in the way that Jeannie never manages to capture your attention. We always know she's going to stand up in court and say, no, I cannot tell a lie. Whereas with Effie, the character actually changes when you see a side of Effie in the court where she suddenly has dignity uh, once her father's been yeah. removed after he collapses. And I think that's partly why we have four volumes, is Scott's just returning to this tale. Yes. Um, I mean, Jeannie and, and Ruben Butler, for me, are just, you know, a stock character, actually. Yes. The good woman. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'd just like to hear more about Effie. Effie's certainly attracted to some of these Victorian artists who uh, they, they, they were just as much drawn, if not more, to the pre-Raphaelite artists. We showed one instance in, in uh, characterizing, drawing Effie rather than Jeannie. But that probably tells us more about the 1890s and the shift in, in sensibilities. I'm not sure whether the readership of the Regency period would have seen uh, Effie as a, um, an energetic, uh, interesting character quite so much. I'm, I don't know. Certainly tragic. Uh, tragic. Is, is she not, though, supine? She, I can't understand why she doesn't clear off when they break the 
when a, a boyfriend actually orchestrates a riot to get her out of jail, you know. Break the story if you did. Pardon? It would break, break the story. It would break the narrative. <laughs> she, she has to remain in the tomb. Yeah. Uh, and it, David. I, I would say Effie was totally unrealistic, latterly. As Lady Staunton, uh, she is uh, quite in incredible, I think. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, she comes back as this, uh, this beauty, uh, uh, fashionable world, and has a lot of dignity. And of course, one, in, from a modern point of view, I admire her, sort of having lifted herself up the social scale through her intelligence and wits and wit and beauty, doesn't one? I mean, she'd be a celeb in today's world. I, I, could, I, I, I couldn't uh, um, recon re rec reconcile that with the original. How she managed to achieve that in five years or something, and so much education, it seemed to me, uh, yes. made, made her a, a, a paste. Yes, yes. yes. Mm. I think we are drawing up to the witching hour, but the, the common, thanks so much for the participation that we've had. It's very, very welcome. Can I finish with this? Um, there is a, I, I've got to finish this. You finish with that, and I'll finish with mine. Okay. <laughs> not if I read, read the uh, part of the speech of Jeannie Deans to the Queen. Um, under the uh, guidance uh, and the presence of uh, John, Red John of the Battles, as he's known in the family, the Red John, second Duke of Argyle. And Jeannie says to the Queen, I would have gone to the ends of the earth, madam, to save the life of John Porteous, or any other man in his condition, but I lawfully doubt whether I can do so. It is for the civil magistrate to do this. He is dead and gone to his place, and they that have slain him must answer for their own acts. But my sister, my poor Effie, still lives. Though her days and hours are numbered, she still lives and a word of the king's mouth would restore her to a broken-hearted old man that never in his daily or nightly exercise forgot to pray that his majesty might be blessed with a long and prosperous reign and that his throne and the throne of his posterity should be established. So, madam, if ever you can, what it was like to sorrow and to have a sinner and a suffering creature in the family whose mind is so so tossed that she can neither be called fit to live or die, then have some compassion on this. Save an honest house from dishonour and an unhappy girl not 18 years of age from an early and dreadful death. Alas, it is not when we weep soft and wake merrily ourselves that we think of other people's sufferings. Our hearts are waxed light within us when and when we are fighting for our own wrongs and writing our own battles. But when the hour of trouble comes to the mind and to the body, and seldom may, seldom may it come to your, to your ladyship, when that hour of death comes, and it comes high and low, long may it not be yours. So, my lady, then it is not when we have done to ourselves, but what we have done to others, and what we think on most incessantly. And the thoughts that you have intervened to spare a poor thing's life will be sweeter when that hour comes to you, come when it may. This is eloquence, said the Queen. Mm -hmm. yeah, it is, of course, yes. uh, very quickly, our next two events. On Thursday, the 6th of September, at 7 o'clock, our usual time, Dr. Stuart Allen on Scott's relationship with General David Stuart of Garth, author of Sketches of the Highlands of Scotland. And on Friday, the 21st of September, the day of Scott's death in 1832, a laying of the reef at his grave in Dryborough, Abbey by Alistair Hutton at 2.30. And if you're a member of Historic Scotland or English Heritage, it's free to get into Dryborough Abbey, otherwise six pounds, four pounds eighty for concessions otherwise. The timing 2.30 allows the opportunity to have lunch in Melrose or at Abbotsford or the close by Dryborough Arms Hotel beforehand. So I hope I'll see some of you there. And lastly, I'm going to call, it's a pleasure to call on David Hill to give the vote of thanks. David, thank you very much for leading us to see you, yes, for leading us in this seminar. I enjoy these occasions really more than any others that we hold. First, uh, because it makes us read the book or reread the book. And second, because uh, perhaps we feel nearly on equal terms with our speaker in that we have common knowledge 
So often our speakers talk about something about which I have never the slightest uh, knowledge. But um, the, um, we, we are not really quite on equal terms because, uh, except if, if David Hewitt and Alison Lumsden had been here, they clearly know as much also as Peter knows. But um, David has brought such intimate knowledge of the text. Now, I am familiar with the work of condensing uh, novels because I uh, worked in uh, English as a foreign language and uh, prepared many graded readers, which are redactions of the main novel. And uh, it is extremely difficult to reduce both length and linguistic and uh, narrative complexity. It's very necessary, as you can understand, for learners of English, um, but it is thought to be easy, and it is not. If you do a hatchet job with scissors and paste, the result is terrible. Um, and you have to work with such problems about the sequencing of backstories and other um, difficulties in maintaining the narrative, but also keeping the secret going. Purists have always despised the graded readers for EFL, and I fought with them for over 50 years. I tried to present to suggest that learners of English had benefited hugely from them. I'm sure that the people uh, who read uh, David's redaction will also benefit, and Scott's reputation will benefit. We need, uh, what have I written here, so sorry. Um, the next thing we must all do is actually get a copy of David's redaction and see what he has done with it. In the meantime, I'm sure you will all join me in thanking David for his uh, leadership this, uh, this morning in the normal way. And have a couple of copies of the book here. Yeah. Yes, the door should be.